If you clicked on this video, you probably have chronic digestive issues. But I'm here today to tell you that your digestive system is connected to more than just your digestive problems. You see, what's happening in your digestive system influences your mood, your body's ability to withstand and respond to stress. There are very characteristic changes in behavior and mental health, including things like depression, anxiety, procrastination, and even perfectionism. And what I'm going to do for you today is reveal the link between these things and help you see how this is a vicious cycle that becomes that self perpetuates and it feels like you can never get out of it. But you can, and I'm going to show you how. So first of all, let's get the science out of the way. I want to show you two studies here, and then I'm going to explain and elaborate on what they actually mean. So reading from the conclusion of this first study, it states, acute psychological stress induces small intestinal permeability in humans. So what this tells us is stress is directly connected to intestinal permeability. When an individual is experiencing stress, and in this study, they're looking at the psychological stress, they were making people do public speaking. So you can imagine quite stressful. However, I don't think it's a very far jump to consider that all stress is going to have a same physiological impact in the body. So whether this is a mental or emotional stress, like giving a speech, or if this is a physiological stress, like exposing the body to some kind of toxic chemical, or say spraining the ankle or some kind of injury, this stress is going to result in the same outcome, increased intestinal permeability. Now it gets a bit complex here, but I'll break it down. Peripheral CRH reproduces the effect of stress and DSCG blocks the effect of both stress and CRH. So to break that down into some form of human language, what this is telling us is that the mechanism by which the intestinal permeability is increasing is mediated by mast cells. Mast cells being a part of our immune system. If you have histamine intolerance or mast cell activation syndrome, you don't need me to tell you anything about mast cells because you're probably very well aware. But what they were able to do was for these individuals, they were able to give them a mast cell stabilizer. So this is a medicine that in essence prevents or inhibits mast cell activity. So even though the individual was stressed, usually what happens is the mast cells will also get stressed and they will activate. And as a consequence, they release histamine and clearly, according to this study, can have some influence on the intestinal permeability levels in the gut. But what's really important for you to understand here, very simple equation, stress equals intestinal permeability. More stress equals more intestinal permeability. So if we go from here onto the next study, what they were doing in this experiment was injecting endotoxin into people. Endotoxin is a inflammatory substance that's produced by gram-negative bacteria. And consequently, the place we find this often in nature is inside the digestive system. And the conclusions of this study state that endotoxin treatment induced a short time rise in plasma IL-6 and a longer increase in IL-1RA. Again, back in human speak, this means that endotoxin exposure triggered an activation of the immune system. It continues to say salivary cortisol levels were significantly increased during the acute phase. So what this means is this physiological stress, this injection of essentially a poison, a toxin into the body, triggered an acute stress response. The conclusions that they came to with this study, highlighted here at the bottom, were that persistent lipopolysaccharide induced psychological and physiological changes beyond the acute phase further supports the safety of endotoxin administration in humans, which if you're just reading it on the surface, it looks like it means this is not a very harmful substance. However, this is based on the assumption that you have one acute exposure to lipopolysaccharides or endotoxin, but it doesn't elaborate on what would happen to an individual if they were exposed to this multiple, several times a day, or even if they were exposed to a constant stream of endotoxin. And this is where today's video really starts to get interesting. So here is what I really want you to understand. We've got this chicken and an egg situation where when you have stress, you will have increased levels of intestinal permeability. The thing is, if you have increased levels of intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut. So if you have bad leaky gut, any endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide that's produced inside your gut is going to leak into your body. And that second study just shows us if you have an acute exposure to endotoxin, it triggers a stress response. It triggers a release of a cortisol spike. And as the first study explained, stress causes leaky gut. So now you can see we've got this vicious cycle where you're stressed about something. This could be a psychological stress, like public speaking. This could be like me a couple of weeks ago doing my driving test. You know, that was so stressful. I felt adrenaline levels through the roof. I know for sure my intestinal permeability levels were way higher. It doesn't really matter what the 
stress is. This can be a psychological stress. This can be a physiological stress. For example, if you have amalgam fillings and you get them removed, that's a big stress. If you're mold sensitive and you enter a water damaged building, that's an acute stress. If you eat a meal and it has ingredients that you are sensitive to, it exacerbates your leaky gut and you absorb lots of endotoxin, that is an acute stress. All of these stresses then perpetuate leaky gut and gut dysbiosis. Now, the only thing we've really looked at so far with regards to endotoxin is how it influences the permeability levels in the gut. However, there are some very interesting links connecting lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin exposure and behavioral changes that, when observed, tend to resemble clinical depression. In fact, and this will absolutely blow your mind, the conventional medical treatment for depression are SSRI drugs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, things like Prozac and citalopram. Now, how do you think they test the efficacy of these drugs? Well, what they do, they get people or rats or mice and they inject them with endotoxin because they know it causes depression or depression-like symptoms. They will then administer the SSRI or medication, whatever it is that they're trialing, to see how much it influences that behavioral change. And ideally, if it is an effective drug, an effective antidepressant, those symptoms of endotoxin exposure, i.e. depression-like symptoms, are reduced. But the way that I'm looking at it, it feels a little bit backwards. Instead of giving somebody a drug to reduce the symptoms of depression, why don't we look to see if they're being chronically exposed to endotoxin? Wouldn't that make a little bit more sense? So this vicious circle gets even more vicious because what happens to somebody when they're being constantly exposed to endotoxin? They're experiencing depression-like symptoms. If you have other fragments of microbial organisms coming from your gut, endotoxin is just one that we have studied. There are thousands of different organisms and millions of different compounds that can come from the digestive system. I really don't think it's a difficult conclusion to jump to the fact that if one molecule can cause depression or depression-like behaviors, there must be dozens of other molecules that cause all different types of behavioral changes and mental health symptoms like anxiety. We had a really small mention just a minute ago about mast cells. The thing about mast cells is they produce histamine. Also, many bacteria in the gut can produce histamine. If your gut is damaged and if you have very high levels of intestinal permeability, your ability to break down histamine is reduced. Histamine actually functions as a neurotransmitter. It directly influences how you feel. And some of the symptoms of histamine intolerance include tachycardia and heart palpitations, anxiety and panic attacks. And these are all based on this physiological molecule. But the most vicious point of this whole circle. What happens to somebody when they are drowning in depression and anxiety and they're procrastinating doing the things that they want to do? They stop taking action. They stop trusting themselves. They stop believing in themselves. And when you're faced with all of these mental health problems, all these symptoms, procrastination, perfectionism, OCD, ADHD, the only thing you're provided is a medication or maybe therapy. And maybe there's a hope that that will help you to change these behaviors. Thing is, there's a physiological root. There are physical chemicals inside the body that are influencing the way that you feel. And I think you'll really easily be able to understand this if you're somebody that is struggling with depression and anxiety. How much more stressful is it for you to do public speaking? I know many people that have experienced anxiety and depression. They find it hard to just talk to a single person, a random stranger let alone stand in front of a hundred, a thousand people on a stage. The level of stress that that person would experience is 10 times higher than that of an average person. And what happens when they're experiencing this stress at a 10 times higher level? What happens to their gut permeability? Their gut is just shredded. It's so leaky. Even more endotoxins, even more histamine, even more of all of these different chemicals and compounds that we don't even truly know what they are. They're leaking through this gut lining that's not even really a gut lining anymore. It's just a sieve. It's full of hole because the level of perceived stress is so high the intestinal permeability levels match it. Now, if we've got to this point in the video and you're thinking, this really sounds like me, let me tell you, you are not alone because this was a story about me. Everything that I have outlined in this video, I have experienced firsthand. It's really nice that we're starting to get some scientific evidence that backs these things, but I figured all of this out through firsthand experience of going through exactly the situation that I just outlined. So let me tell you from the other side, whilst I'm not 100% just yet. I am so much healthier than I ever believed would even be remotely possible for me. I was at the point where I didn't know if I could even survive. I genuinely, seriously planned and contemplated suicide more times than I can count. And to go from that place to the point where I now have an amazing relationship. I'm married. I mean, I didn't even know if that was, that was even possible. Who would want to marry a, a broken person like me? I have a career, a job that I really enjoy. I mean, I get to sit here and create YouTube videos. That's, that's pretty cool, right? And I get to travel around the world. You know, I'm recording this video in Thailand. I'd never even left England before I got sick. And a big part of my healing was actually leaving the place where I was. So I just really want to emphasize that this feels like you. If you're feeling resonance and this is kind of giving you a couple of aha moments and you're really connecting with this story, just know it really does get better. If you can implement the correct strategic changes, recovery is truly possible. And I've done it. 
but I've also seen dozens of other people do it as well. I'm not just this one outlier. I see this every single day. So I really just want to emphasize, don't give up, don't lose hope. So now I want to give you some practical takeaways. What can we do about? Well, if you're quite a, a logical person and you would like to have like a data, if you can't just take my word for it, there are a couple of tests you can do. First of all, you can test your intestinal permeability level. So this is something that you would do as part of the stool test. And the marker that you'd specifically be looking for is called zonulin. So this isn't 100% a confirmation, but higher levels of zonulin tend to be correlated with higher levels of intestinal permeability. Something you have to understand about intestinal permeability is that it fluctuates. There's no such thing as somebody that has leaky gut. Everybody has increased levels of intestinal permeability throughout the day. For example, if you take somebody that's completely healthy and you make them do something that is extremely stressful, for example, running a marathon, if you measure their levels of intestinal permeability after they cross the finish line, their intestinal permeability levels will be insanely high. It would look like they have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So it fluctuates and it's important to consider that. You know, if you do a stool test and you're not really very flexible, up, your gut health symptoms are pretty good, your zonulin levels might look low. And that's great because it means that at that time, your intestinal permeability levels are low. Whereas if you do it in the middle of a massive flare up, you know, where you're reacting to everything, you're having histamine symptoms, everything's going completely haywire, your levels might look insanely high. And you might think that you have super high leaky gut forever. But as soon as you come out of that flare up, your leaky gut levels will come right back down. So it's really important that you don't see it as a black and white thing. It fluctuates second to second. Even for me, recording this video right now, this is slightly more stressful than my normal daily activities. I'm sure my intestinal permeability levels will be slightly higher. So it's really important that you remember that and that you look at these tests in context. If you are going to do a stool test, you could also consider testing your microbiome. So this would provide you with some helpful data as to where you have potentially imbalances in your microbiome and they can provide some strategic interventions to help you with correcting your microbiome imbalance. Leaky gut is always correlated with microbiome dysbiosis every single time. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because people that have very high leaky gut generally have very high stress, whether this is from work stress, whether this is physiological, like a mold exposure or endotoxin exposure. But when the body is in this stressed state, you see a depression in immune function. If the immune system isn't working properly. It can't regulate the microbiome. Your microbiome doesn't happen to you your microbiome is very carefully orchestrated by your immune system. So if your microbiome's off, your immune system's off. And if you're stressed all the time, physiologically or psychologically, that's going to directly influence it. In my experience of all of the different supplements, you know, there are hundreds, probably even thousands went out of different gut health supplements. The supplements that I have found to be the most helpful and have the largest significant impact for the most amount of people, hands down, probiotics would come in at number one. So if you do a stool test, you can target your probiotics a little bit better. Whether you have a stool test or not, I've got a really awesome guide. It's literally a step-by-step -step of exactly how to use probiotics in the most optimal way to minimize reactions. You know, if you're one of these people that say, I can't take probiotics, Yes, you can. There is a way. I was also one of these people. I've worked with hundreds of people that are probiotic intolerant and we found a way. And it's so beautiful when I receive a message or see a comment somewhere where someone's saying, I was probiotic intolerant. Now I'm taking a really high dose. My symptoms are so much better. My histamine intolerance is gone. It's just absolutely amazing to see that. So make sure you check out that guide. I'll stick it up on the screen somewhere, leave a link in the description, or you can just go and search for it. Just type in the search bar, step-by-step -step ultimate probiotic guide, William Dickinson, and you'll find it. It's a really good video. You'll love it. So unquestionably probiotics, number one suggestion. They're the things that have made the most difference for the most people in my experience. The other angle that I would come at this from a physiological perspective would be to make sure that you're digesting your food correctly. So depending on where you're digesting, digestive system is struggling, you're going to need different support. This could look like stomach acid. This could look like digestive enzymes, bile. This could look like supporting the brush border. It's going to look a little bit different for everybody. But as a general rule of thumb, I would take a look at what foods you tend to not feel very good when you eat them. So for example, if it's all starchy carbohydrates, if you don't feel good when you're eating pasta, bread, and rice, then there's a really good likelihood that you're missing amylase, which is the digestive machinery that helps your body break these things down. So a digestive enzyme containing amylase and then maltase as the second stage of starch digestion could be really helpful. Whereas if you're somebody that doesn't feel very good when you eat meat, generally this indicates a lack of stomach acid. We could look at supporting stomach acid is to take betaine HCL, but I know not everybody can take that. I was also one of these people, didn't do well with betaine HCL from a chronic gastritis kind of 
situation. So we also have a really nice video, what to do if you have low stomach acid and you can't tolerate betaine HCL. You can also check that video out here. So I'll stick that up here somewhere so that you can get that or again, stick it down below in the description. And finally, if you're struggling with fats, there's a really good likelihood that your liver is struggling. Your gallbladder isn't producing bile or the bile is not very good quality. So looking at supporting your liver health, maybe considering an ox bile, su an ox bile supplement, Tudka or supporting methylation. Anything that helps you love your liver is going to improve the quality of your bile and therefore improve your ability to digest and absorb fats. So physiologically, that's the best way you can help yourself. You also have to look at the psychological components here. Now, I'll be the first person to say you cannot meditate out of chemical depression. If you have endotoxin streaming through your blood, there is no way you can meditate yourself out of that chemical depression. However, this is what you need to think about. If you are able to put your body in a calmer state, your intestinal permeability levels will drop literally second to second. If you're extremely stressed, and you take a deep breath in and you let it go and you genuinely feel some level of relaxation in your body and in your nervous system, your intestinal permeability has just decreased by about 10%, literally with one breath. I know that sounds insane, but it's actually true. So we need to look at where you're experiencing stress in your life and we need to improve your stress management. Now, this is actually a double-edged sword because whilst I am going to encourage you to move out of a state of distress, which is where you're chronically stressed all the time at a low level, and this is what meditation and mind-body practices can help with, I'm actually going to encourage you, I'm going to put push you to actually take a leap and jump and do some of the things that you're actually avoiding because they feel a bit stressful or like a little bit too much. So whatever that looks like for you, if that's a conversation that you really need to have with somebody that you're avoiding, if this is setting a boundary, if this is asking for that raise at work, if this is chewing through a conflict with your partner so you can get to a place where you're both a little bit more connected, if it's something big like record your first YouTube video and start a YouTube channel, if it's go for your driving license like I just recently did, it was going to rent a motorbike and driving around on the streets in Thailand on a motorbike. That was extremely scary. I know my stress levels were up here and my intestinal permeability levels were up here. They were completely off the charts for the first few days that I started doing it, but my body began to acclimate and it said okay this isn't that stressful we can deal with it so whilst you do need to focus on reducing your chronic states of distress which is like worry and anxiety it's actually really important that you push yourself and tackle these challenges overcome adversity yes you might experience some intestinal permeability some increased stress hormones in the short term but in the long term these things actually improve the tightness of the gut they improve this tight junction function because they're giving you evidence that you're a powerful person that you can live in this world comfortably you can set yourself a challenge and you can achieve it and just as chronic stress anxiety and worry increase your intestinal permeability confidence feeling powerful they do the exact opposite they boost your immune system. They improve the diversity of your microbiome. They help you kill pathogens. And I'm sure that there's a biological connection here. You know, literally sitting in a power pose where you've got a straight back and your, your shoulders are, are spread out and you're taking up space. This boosts your serotonin levels. So it's not just about tackling this from one angle. You need to do both at the same time. Work on the gut, improve your microbiome, make sure that you can digest the foods that you're eating, reduce your permeability levels by correcting that microflora imbalance. But also on the other side, manage that chronic distress better. Get yourself out of these states of chronic anxiety and worry, which are just pushing your leaky gut levels through the roof and find something that's a challenge for you and just lock in and go after it. This is one of the things that I really come to love about humanity in general is when we set our mind to something, we just go at it relentlessly, ruthlessly, just find something and throw yourself at it. Whatever it is, even if it feels like a big challenge, you can do it. You have to go for it. I promise you, and I'm telling you this from firsthand experience, as you chase life, as you do the things that you want in life, whatever they are, it will directly positively influence your chronic health problem. I 100% promise and guarantee it. I see it every single time with every single one of my coaching clients, with myself, with my wife, my family. Every time I see someone set themselves a goal and just go at it, it has a direct positive influence on their physical health. So I hope that that's answers some questions for you. I hope it's given you a bit of an action plan so you know how to get started with this. And I'd be really interested to hear from you if you've had any of these experiences. Have you ever exposed yourself to an acute stress and notice how much of an impact it has on your physical health? And depending where you are in your health journey, have you tried any of these interventions? For example, have you supported your digestive system or maybe started with some microbiome improvements and seen 
behavioral changes in other areas of your life, like your confidence levels or the anxiety or depression that you've experienced. Let me know. I'd be really interested to hear. And again, you never know who's reading these comments. You never know whose life you might positively influence just by simply sharing a little bit about what you've been going through and the knowledge or lessons that you've learned. So make sure you leave us a comment and let me know. I'll be really interested to hear. That's everything for me today. Take care and I'll see you then. Bye.